Welcome to SSBMS's webinar for our Honoring Wishes program, Broaching End-of-Life Care with Patients and How to Begin a Dialogue. I'm Lindsay Coates. I am the uh, SSBMS Vice President of Strategic Operations, and I invite everyone to say hello with, with your name in the chat, as well as your group and your specialty. Tonight's hour-long presentation is worth one CME credit, and tomorrow you will receive a link to the evaluation form, and then CME certificates will be emailed to you next week. Now, as the webinar progresses this evening, you may have some questions, so please direct all content questions to the Q&A function, and we'll attempt to answer all of them if time is permitted. Now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker tonight. Dr. Elizabeth, or Lizzie Giles, is a hospice and palliative care specialist in the Sacramento area who is also a board-certified family uh, physician, family medicine physician. With over 10 years of experience, she brings a vast wealth of knowledge to Yolo Hospice, where she serves as the medical director. One of her goals there is to change the perception of hospice care from a loss to an opportunity to provide comfort in an often frightening situation. Dr. Giles, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you, that was really kind. It's so exciting to be here with you guys. I know we're still remote, but let's do our best. So um, let's just go ahead and get started. Let's see. So I have nothing to disclose. Unfortunately, no one pays me extra money. <laughs> um, so the objectives for my half of the presentation will just be to kind of define advanced care planning, including the major components of it um, and advanced directives and assigning a proxy. And then I'm gonna review the five wishes advanced care directive, kind of it's, it's big picture. And then I'm gonna review the post form. And then I'm gonna introduce you guys to kind of a semi-structured format for effectively facilitating advanced care planning conversations. So if I can get that done, you know, in a few minutes, I will feel successful. So here's a case I think a lot of us can can um, kind of empathize with this case. So Mrs. Campbell is a 76 year old woman with a 16 year history of Parkinson's disease. She is a retired high school music teacher who volunteers in various activities in her community and enjoys hiking and travel. Over the past year, Mrs. Campbell has experienced some cognitive decline. Her mocha is now 22 over 30, and she falls one to two times per month, generally when she doesn't use her walker. She and her husband have not completed advanced directives or proxy paperwork. So the question for this case is, does Mrs. Campbell need advanced care planning? What, what kind of advanced care planning does she need? And if she presents to you at clinic or in the hospital or in the nursing home or somewhere, <laughs> how will you bring it up? And then what are your goals as a physician for this conversation? So I like to think of myself, you know, when I'm playing the role as a hospice and palliative medicine physician, but also when I used to be a family physician too, is that we really are guides as physicians and we're the interface between a patient, their values, their understanding, their wishes, their hopes, their dreams, their culture, their obligations, all of that and the medical system, particularly for advanced care planning, their interactions with the emergency medical system, the ER and hospital care. So that's a big, I just wanna appreciate for all of us that that's a pretty big, um, weight to bear, and that can feel like a lot, but that's kind of what we're called to do as physicians, to really help patients and families understand how they want to interface with that system. So for this case and for all of you guys, I think there's two kind of concepts that are intertwined. First is the idea of goals of care, and the other one is advanced care planning. So I know there's a lot of push, you know, with billing, with health systems that we need to create a lot of documents. We need to create advanced care documents. We need to create directives. We need to create pulse. 
but a document is really only as good as the conversation that generated it. So really what generates an advanced care directive is a goals of care conversation. And that is an iterative conversation with a patient and family that's ideally conducted over multiple visits, right? So even if you're in the hospital um, working, you know, as a hospitalist or as a specialist, you know, it's a different time crunch in the hospital, but hopefully, you know, as you're getting to know patients there or seeing them, you're, ha you're picking off pieces of this goals of care um, conversation. And you are, it is a departure from usual approach of talking about treatments because in goals of care discussions, it's not really obvious what the patient should or shouldn't choose. <laughs> you know, when you have your um, really healthy adult come in and um, they're a pre-diabetic, you're going to hit them hard with the conversation about lifestyle changes. And, and it's really important that, you know, you convince them that not progressing to diabetes is in their best interest. But when you're dealing with someone like Mrs. Campbell, um, you know, she has a lot of risk factors for poor outcomes of different hospitalizations and different treatments. So when you're talking out to her, it's a different conversation and really strongly relies on her values and takes into consideration her frailty as a significant variable. And the goals of care discussions remain an individual clinician's responsibility because again, our patients, even the ones that are in healthcare, they really don't know how to navigate the system very well. And they really need the experts to kind of actually act as guides and support for them. And if you do this well and you improve on it over the weeks and years of your practice, it really does build trust and good relationships because patients really want to feel guided and supported through these decisions. So when you're having these conversations, you may determine that a particular document needs to come out of it. And then these are advanced care directives. They cover specific scenarios. They're usually part of public policy, right? There are all these rules surrounding how to correctly fill out an advanced directive, how to make it legally binding, how to make a pulse legally binding. So it also needs a system and an infrastructure and legal support. And it's a tangible outcome, right? I could write a note about a goals of care conversation. It has some weight, it has some significance, it matters. But when that patient shows up in the hospital, out of it and no one can access my note. It's not as powerful in that scenario as having a document that accompanied it. So <laughs> coming back to Mrs. Campbell. So she needs an advanced care directive and a post. So she should definitely consider this and we should offer this to her because as I said before, she is at high risk for medical complications and hospitalizations. And importantly, we know that a lot of patients with Parkinson's and other diseases, they can actually lose their decision-making capacity and she still has it. <laughs> so she has the capacity to make her wishes known to me as her physician, if I was her physician, she can make her wishes known to her family and her loved ones. And she can also elect a durable power of attorney for her medical decision to be her voice. So she's in a very powerful position right now. And she's also in a very vulnerable position, meaning, you know, for medical complications. And why does she need a pulsed form or why should she consider it? Well, she has a serious illness in an advanced stage. So she does have Parkinson. She's having a lot of falls. She is having some, some diminishing cognitive capacity and she's at high risk for a medical complication. I could imagine that she may have start having trouble maybe with her swallowing. She may fall and have a hip fracture. I can imagine a lot of complications that may not go as well as for someone without Parkinson's or if she was at an earlier stage of her disease. So this is a great little reminder is that um, advanced care planning documents, right, include advanced care directives, living wills, power of attorneys, and they have um, a purpose 
for the advanced care directive of identifying the surrogate decision making and making very general wishes. And actually all adults, so anybody 18 and older can fill out an advanced care directive. But guess what? <laughs> Those are not the five second documents that you need to determine in the ER whether you're gonna resuscitate someone or put them on a ventilator, take them straight to surgery because they're very broad documents, but they can tell you who to talk to. But the POLST form is a medical order. So if you look on that side of this, um, this table, they're actually an order that, that a medical provider has to follow through with. And they cover very specific scenarios and they're intended for people who may have life-threatening conditions based on their overall medical condition. So they don't have to be a senior, you know, they could be a younger person, um, but they have to, it, it makes more sense to do this document for somebody who's at high risk for complication. And they can be used in an emergency. Okay. So again, the, the key differences, right? So an advanced care directive, the, the individual fills it out and makes it legal and it's very general. Um, but sometimes it's like in a corner or in a safe, it's hard to find. The pulse form, like I said, is a medical order. It has to be filled out by a doctor or nurse practitioner or PA. And it is, in, it is um, identified for seriously ill or frail patients. It does not appoint a surrogate. Right, so that has to be done in advanced care directive. And it's very specific and it's small, like, you know, one page. And it should be something that can be easy to find um, in a public place. Um, some people keep it on their refrigerator door. So that's kind of the difference. So if we're talking to Ms. Campbell and we're bringing up the five wishes advanced care directive, we may want to see if she's done any other ones. So that's a good reminder. So in California, a lot of people do um, trusts. You know, they do a will and a trust. And in doing that, they've filled out an advanced care directive. But Mrs. Campbell may have done that, you know, before she got diagnosed with Parkinson's. And so we would want to like bring that document up again. So one of the tips I have for, um, bringing up advanced care planning, especially something like the five wishes, is to put that as part of my agenda setting. So I'd like to talk about advanced care planning today. And if they're like, I can't do it, <laughs> you know, I, I have other things that are more important doc, then guess what you do? You say, then we're gonna make an appointment in a week. <laughs> so you make it a priority. And then you kind of do that open-ended question thing that, that we learn. Um, what have you heard about advanced care planning? Like maybe they're giving you this blank look like doc, I have no idea what you're talking about. So you might explain it a little bit like this is an opportunity for you to let me know your general wishes if you were to get very sick and who could make decisions for you if you weren't able to, boom. And then, you know, you try to get a little buy-in. Does this sound like something that would benefit you or that would benefit your loved ones, you know, so they would know your wishes? And then I also say, you know, if you're, if at this point the patient's like still on the fence, get personal. Why do you believe it's important for that patient to do an advanced care planning? Or why is it important for anyone that's in a similar situation? So, you know, I went to a presentation once that talked about how to get patients to do their colonoscopy screening. And, <laughs> and the one of the docs with the highest rate you know, he said that his secret was just to say, I think this is really important for you and I care about you. And I think this could really keep you safe. And that, that spoke to his patients and they agreed to do the test. So whatever your talk off is, it, it, it can come from the heart. And then you can clarify initial questions, right? These are not, um, scary, these can be a little bit scary documents, but if they're, if they're very approachable, like the five wishes, a lot of times patients will feel comfortable looking them. And then you set up your follow-up appointment to continue the conversation or review the document. So um, the medical society are um, 
our group has has come with our recommendation that uh, five wishes is a great advanced care directive and a kind of our choice one. So if you have a chance to see that, um, I think you'll understand why. I recently even had a young patient who was only in her twenties and she was like, actually this document makes a lot of sense to me. I'd like to fill it out. So again, there's five wishes. The first wish is the person I want to make care decisions for me. And again, that's only when the patient cannot make them. And then the second wish is what kind of treatment you want. The third wish is how comfortable you wanna be if you were near the end of your life usually, how you want people to treat you, and then what you want your loved ones to know. So it's pretty comprehensive. And a lot of patients really resonate with those questions. They seem very reasonable. So when should you do this? Well, this would be a great one for Ms. Campbell, right? Because she's starting to have a change in her clinical status. She's falling a lot. She's not comprehending as much as she used to. Um, it can also be a great time to do on annual visits. You can introduce it gently, but I would use a headline if needed. Like, Mrs. Campbell, you know, your Parkinson's is advancing. And I think this is a great moment to consider what you would want if you got really sick. That's something a headline. And she might say, Doc, why? And you would just say, look, you know, you've had some falls. Well, you could be in the hospital. You know, you can build on that. I would avoid euphemisms in this situation. Um, but still use compassion. And then close follow up if the patient doesn't complete it. Um, the other thing is to enlist your colleagues. You know, as a hospice and palliative medicine doc, sometimes my patients will tell me, I've been going to this pulmonologist for 20 years and I love them. And I only came to see you because they said you were good. <laughs> And I, you know, I keep that little bit of knowledge in my brain and I say, well, you know, if I can't convince them of something, I'm going to see if that pulmonologist will, will join me in encouragement. <laughs> so here are my tips on the pulsed. So I don't do it in the order it's written. And I hope I have time to go through this because I'm, I'm already telling that I'm a little bit slow tonight. Um, so you'll see this little road through the pulsed. So I ask an easy question when I do the pulse. I say, are you still open to going to the hospital? If someone tells me I don't wanna to go to the hospital, like that's a fulcrum point for me. That means we really need to talk about what their goals are. And it's not a bad thing. It just means they're really clear about kind of where they are. But a lot of patients will be like kind of relieved. Like, yes, I still wanna to go to the hospital. You're not gonna keep me out of the hospital, are you? And I'm like, no, I'm not, that's not my goal. And then I would say something like, if you were very sick and your body was shutting down and your heart and lungs stopped working, would you like to have CPR? And if they get a heartbeat, go to the ICU? Or at that point, would you like to go naturally? So I'm really asking them if they wanna have CPR and intubation. And then I would ask them the third question I have here. If you were no longer able to eat by mouth, would you be open to a feeding tube through your nose or directly into your stomach? If yes, do you want it for a short term to get better or for the long term? So those are generally my three questions I ask in the pulse. And I put below on this slide, kind of how they correspond to the pulse paperwork. So the first question, instead of asking them if they want CPR, right, I've asked them if they wanna to go to the hospital. And that corresponds to if they would like selective full or comfort focused treatment. So if they wanna to go to the hospital, they want full treatment or selective treatment, and we can get to that. And then my second question is really whether they want CPR or not. And my third question gets to artificial nutrition. And then my tips below is, if someone says they want full treatment, I always ask them kind of, would you want to be on the vent for many months? Would you be, want to be on it permanently? And I'm ask, actually asking that to no. A lot of my patients will say, no, I would want it only for a short term to get better, would not wanna live on a vent. So I can actually put that in the post. And then 
you know, I think it's important that we all understand how the hospital works. That's why I say when you have CPR, you have to go to the ICU because 99% of the time, if they get a heartbeat back, they're going to send you to the ICU. So it's really important for families to know that. And then when someone says they want artificial nutrition, I try to understand if they want it long-term or short-term. And then I usually like to ask if, it, if you were on your final days, would you want to be artificially fed at that point? And most people say no. So I usually put on their post, no end of life feeding. I know I'm going really fast, but these are my big tips. <laughs> so again, use the patient voice. So if somebody says, I don't want to live on a machine, I would put on that post in that additional orders, patient does not want to live on a machine. <laughs> and then I try to get a feel for the patient's wishes. So they might say things like, you know, I go through a lot to get better, but I don't want to live on machines. And then if the patient and their surrogate or DPOA are very in a very open relationship, I would love to ask these questions with their DPOA present so that they can hear the answers. Um, and then whenever someone says, I don't want to be a burden, I usually probe that because I just want to understand where the person is coming from. And I just want to put a little plug that uh, a social worker I used to work with, Shannon Hartman, really helped improve my skills at doing the pulse. So I want to give her some credit. So it's important to know that when patients complete an advanced care directive or a pulse, what we found in the literature is that it can reduce anxiety and increase clarity. As a physician, it can help you build trust. It's actually been shown that these discussions can reduce post-traumatic stress disorder for people who do experience um, kind of a difficult death. And it can, strangely enough, improve family dynamics, right? Because everybody knows what the patient wants. That doesn't make it always easier, but it can improve it. It can also, if the person is very clear about what they want, it can reduce hospitalizations, it can decrease invasive care at end of life, and it can increase hospice utilization. So that's gonna end my first part. And I would just say, again, the reason why these documents work when they do is because they've come out of a compassionate and caring conversation. And so hopefully these tips that myself and Dr. Sultani will give you will help you have those really effective conversations so that the documents mean something to the families and can be used. All right, I'm gonna stop and let Dr. Sultani go next. <laughs> um, before I introduce Dr. Sultani, um, there is a question for you in the chat, Dr. Giles. Um, can you talk more about euphemism? Are there any good ones which are just totally off limits to you? Yeah, so that's a great question. So. I'll bring you back to a great experience I had when I was in training. So I had a wonderful uh, training doctor who was a first generation American and her family was from Pakistan. And she said to me, she said, she said, Lizzie, please don't say something like when, when you have to go, <laughs> because she said that was told once to her family member. And they, they looked at her and said, like, go where, go on vacation, <laughs> go, go where. So, um, you know, I think when, you know, as, as you saw in my presentation, I said, you know, when, when your heartbeat and your lung is not working, would you like to go naturally? And if somebody says, what do you mean by go? I would say, well, in that case, you would actually be dying. And so we would be either trying to bring you back and we may not be successful, or we could let that process be peaceful, a peaceful dying process. So I would say, try to be as direct as you can um, and really try not to use things. If you're gonna use a euphemism, if you just gotta be really clear that it's, it's being well understood. And I think a lot of people don't understand those euphemisms because remember you guys, we're in a high stakes conversation. We're talking about something that's extremely emotional. So what I prefer over euphemisms is warning shots. So I'm gonna to talk to you about something that might be difficult. I'd rather say that and then say the difficult thing than try to use a euphemism and they're kind of caught off guard and they didn't understand. So 
And again, I do try to ask an easier question first, like, would you like to go to the hospital? And then I'd say, well, you know, what if you got sicker in the hospital, you got so sick that your heart and lungs stop working? So, you know, I'm kind of building up to that, but I'm not shying away from it. Um, so I would say like going or passing on, even though those are pretty common, I still think they can be confusing to people. Um, so it's like you, I think you're gonna die from this disease. And then sometimes if you use a big word like die or death in your headline, as I mentioned, you gotta really take a moment and let that sink in and let the family and patient respond. Um, okay. All right, thank you, Dr. Question. Giles. <laughs> yeah, that was a great question, great answer. Um, if you all have questions for Dr. Giles, just please add them to the Q&A and we will go over them at the end. Um, speaking at the end of this session today, everyone will be provided access to their own Five Wishes document to ensure your own advanced care plan is properly completed. Our next speaker, speaker Dr. Ethan Sultani, is a board certified family practice physician uh, with also in geriatrics and hospice and palliative care. He completed a family practice residency at Southern Illinois University a geriatric fellowship at Stanford University. Currently, he is in private practice and medical director for interim healthcare hospice and supportive services in Sacramento. Welcome, Dr. Saltani, the floor is yours. All right, uh, good evening, everybody. Can you see my slides? All right, good. And, um... I, I know you guys rather be uh, somewhere having a glass of wine and dinner with your family, but uh, thanks uh, a lot. And I have no um, disclosures. Uh, uh, so I wanted to um, tell you why this is important. So there's a lot of whys, why it's important, why should we do it, where we should do it, and when we should do it. The, the survey shows that this is an extremely important subject for everybody. But there, you can hear from some providers sometimes, oh, I don't have time. This, you know, it takes too much time or this and that. But let me tell you, I will hope that we can uh, get a lot of providers to buy into this and, and start discussing this with their patients. And this is not a one-time discussion. There's not one, uh, uh, one stop uh, shopping. Uh, this is, takes a team. This takes a process. This is a process. You need to bring it on then follow up on it. So they did this, you know, a statistic in 2017, they asked a lot of people, 60% said, I don't wanna be a burden to my family. That's a, that's a huge number of people thinking that way. 70% uh, wants to die at home. The vice versa is correct, as we all know. 80% wants to uh, talk to their doctor about end of life, but 93% said they never did. So we're failing, I guess, uh, in some ways. So, and no matter in what specialty we are, we deal with, a, with uh, uh, geriatric patients. They, they are the one that comes to our office more often. And they, they deal with a lot of chronic conditions, life-limiting illnesses um, that affect their quality of life and uh, quality of life of their families. And as we all know, their daughter, their son, uh, quit their jobs, take care of them. So it is a financial uh, uh, burden to family. The stress, I mean, we know caregiver stress is a huge thing uh, and they get sick. Sometimes they get a heart attack before the patient gets a heart attack. So it's important to bring those on so to reduce not only the, the patient's stress, but also the family. You know, the family will not have that burden when it, the time comes for that tough discussion. So, um, how do you select and, uh, and where and how to start? So I want to make it very simple because it is, it is a simple thing, but it's a process. I mean, it's not a huge problem. It's a very simple thing. What is advanced care planning? And what does it involve? And what's the post as Lizzie just explained beautifully? Uh, and the difference. Dr. Sultani, I'm yes. so sorry. Can you actually um, press play on your slides? Most of them, most of the slide isn't oh. showing. Sure. I'm so sorry to interrupt you. 
Oh yeah, no problem. Let me see where did it go. There we go. Oh yeah. Okay. How's that? Perfect. Thank you. All right. So I'm sorry about that. I'm glad you told me. So um, where to start, how to start. Uh, every practice is different. You make your own, but these are some suggestions. You target certain population and uh, maybe when they're coming for um, annual well visits, maybe they have a procedure coming in. Maybe they are seriously ill, been hospitalized. Maybe they experienced something with their family. Uh, so um, I usually um, do, do them in certain days so I don't have to wait uh, for another patient that come in. I never pr uh, uh, schedule procedure afterwards. I have an hour for each. And sometimes, most of the time they take less than an hour, but sometimes can take more than an hour when there's several family members and there's conflict. So, so you know, choose your setting, choose your time um, and uh, be patient and start listening and, and explain. And then it's extremely important to do the follow-up. Uh, if you don't do the follow-up, it's difficult. And I'm gonna have some suggestions in the next few slides, but why a, a, a healthcare agent is so important when we start to talk to people about advanced care planning. If we don't have the conversation with the agent or the patient doesn't have the, the regular or that important conversation with the agent, they're gonna have a problem deciding when the time comes. And they will, they will be unprepared. They will be under a lot of stress. There will be a lot of family conflicts and decision-making. And it, it, their own emotional distress, their own, um, goal and, and preferences as we all know you know we're the same family but our our, our child has their own ideas when they grow and they're my bro the brothers and sisters they all they have their own values when they grow so it's, it's very hard to to think that oh my my ch my son and my daughter loves me they know me very well i don't need to talk to them about it no that's not true their their your kids doesn't know you how how you want to live that's how i i tell them, you know, let's be prepared for the worst. That's how I start with them. If they say, I don't need to talk to you about this. I said, well, we're all hoping for the best that you will, you will be good and not going to the hospital, not getting sick and be comfortable, everything goes well, but let's be prepared for the worst. And this is the situation. This is, this is what it helps you and your family. So engaging patients uh, in the discussion in the family is, is important. Just taking opportunity, you know, take care of uh, taking advantage of some opportunities um, and how to bring them on into discussion. You make signs in your office. Uh, maybe you're uh, one day a week, you're, they may put a sign in here, you know, have you talked to your doctor about advanced care planning or talk to me about it. Uh, you know, we need to educate our staff also because it's a team effort. They need to talk to them. Maybe a staff can uh, show them a little video before you get into the office at, uh, to the exam room. Maybe when they go out of the office, you give them the after visit summary that says, how was that uh, advanced care planning discussion? Or do you like to have a phone call about this later on? So that kind of keep them, keep them engaged. This is one of the signs in the offices people put like, advanced care planning, talk to me about it. What is it? Do you have any questions about it? And this is another one that you can put um, a poster in your office. Uh, let's talk about advanced care planning. Do you know what it is? Talk, uh, ask your doctor, ask the, your, the medical assistant about it. So, and then after that, you wanna create a follow-up as I say. And um, I, I wanna go a little quicker because there are a couple of videos, I, uh, each one is one to two minutes. I want you guys to listen because they're talking points that help you to start the conversation. And so how to put this into practice is I have a, just a few suggestions. Everyone can make their own. I mean, you can review a chart, your week schedule ahead of time and say, oh, there's three people age 65 plus is coming, two is coming for annual well visit. You, you ask your MA, can you call them or text them and say, hey, do you have advanced care planning? Bring it with you. If you don't, would you like to talk to us? Uh, it, you know, Kaiser texts people. I get texts from Kaiser so many times to say, hey, have you had your advanced care planning? Have you chosen your agent? I mean, we have their phone number. Everybody got cell phone these days. Um, or we can send them a link. You know, look, watch this video before you come and see me. Or I may can show them a very short video 
uh, with the with the laptop while they're in the exam room. Uh, very very effective. I I tell people usually, okay, we didn't have time today to talk about all this, but please go to YouTube, just type advanced care planning. There are, there are some beautiful videos actually people have done and just watch them and next time when you come in, we can discuss that. So that, that brings on conversation, saves you time and you don't have to spend a lot of time at the last minute. You can just give them a couple of your own favorite videos or they can just uh, talk about it. And so to make the, the most uncomfortable subject more comfortable, dying. You need to talk very freely about dying. We're all afraid of talking about dying. And we, I, I usually come across very easy and say, this is a very, very normal subject. We all die. Let's talk about it. What makes you afraid of? What is, what is concerning you about the process? Um, what is, what, and I, I need, and then I just ask them about their culture, their belief, their religion. Do you like to talk to your chapel instead of me? Do you want to talk to my social services? I can have them call you if you don't feel comfortable. What, tell me about it. What, uh, do you feel comfortable? So I, I want to find out their, their comfort level first. And I, then I try to put myself in their shoes and say, oh, hmm, yeah. Uh, this is very tough, but um, let's let's talk about it uh, and and do a follow up. So if you're not ready now, just go ahead and talk to your family, watch some videos, uh, and and then, and then write your questions and come back with all of your questions. Um, and so and then I tell them about why it's important. Why do you have to think about the worst scenario? And I like to sh you guys to listen to this. Listen two minutes. Maria is a 72-year-old widow who lives alone. She has a history of diabetes and hypertension. She was found unconscious in her bathroom and brought to the hospital. After several days of diagnostic testing and evaluation, it was determined she had a major stroke and that the damage to Maria's brain was irreversible. Maria is receiving maximum interventions, including a ventilator and short-term feeding tube. While she may survive, it is unlikely she will ever know who she is or who she is with. Her advanced directive names her daughter, Sophia, as her healthcare agent. The doctors are asking Sophia to decide if life-sustaining treatment should be continued for her mother. Sophia hasn't talked to her mom about these types of decisions and doesn't know her mom's goals, values, and preferences. Maria's two brothers disagree about what should be done. One thinks she would want to keep on fighting. The other believes this is not how she would want to live. Sophia and her family are feeling uncertain and experiencing emotional distress over the situation. This could have been a very different experience. Sophia is facing decisions that could haunt her for years because she doesn't know what her mom would have wanted. Could this situation have been prevented? In this module, We'll show you the role physicians can play in introducing person-centered advanced care planning and motivating patients to participate. You can make a difference. So when, yeah, when something like that happens, obviously we all express our empathy and promote partnership that I'm here to help you. Let's decide. Let's talk about your moms you know, and tell me uh, how, how much uh, talk, your mom talked about the situation. Did she ever tell you that if I am in that situation that I would not recognize people, I cannot swallow or cannot uh, get dressed or take care of my, um, uh, my needs or if I go to the toilet, if I'm not controlling my bowel or bladder, what do I need to do? Has she ever talked to you about those? What's the, what was the quality of life meant to her? And what's very, you know, sustaining, soft, and then stopping, listening um, uh, to see what the family wants and what they, what they know. Um, so the, I think it's a very tough decision uh, and, and tough talk, but we, you have to be very clear, uh, respectful, and a good listener um, and give the family time to think and talk about this. Um, and then... Um, uh, Again, this person choose her daughter, but her daughter didn't know her wishes. So who you trust is very important to choose someone who really knows you and you, you tell them what you need to do during those situations and make sure they're competent. I mean, uh, you're, 
not necessarily in your, an older child is the, the best um, agent because they might not be able to um, express your wishes when the time comes and, um, and, and wouldn't uh, be able to tell exactly what to do. Uh, so what, what is... There is another advanced, decision every uh, person should think about. I'm going to ask you to imagine a situation and then talk about what it means to you. It will be helpful for Sophia to listen to your thoughts and feelings about the situation. Imagine the scenario. You have had a sudden event, such as a car accident or illness, that has left you unable to communicate or make your own health care decisions. You are receiving all the care needed to keep you alive. The doctors believe there is little chance you will recover the ability to know who you are or who you were with. I want to make sure I have explained the situation clearly. Can you tell me in your own words what you understand about the situation? This sounds like I would be a vegetable. What does being a vegetable mean to you? That's what happened to my mother. She didn't know us. She didn't even know herself. If I would not have my mind, that would not be living to me. Yes, you did say earlier that it's important to you to keep your mind busy. Do you have any other questions about the situation? How do the doctors know for sure that she will not get better? What if they are wrong? That's a common question, Sophia. In this situation, the doctors have completed all necessary tests and have gotten additional opinions. The main point of this question is to see what your mother thinks about this type of an outcome, of not being likely to recover her ability to know who she is or who she is with. Would this outcome be acceptable to her or not? This would not be living to me. I would want a 50% chance that I would fully recover. Otherwise, I would not want to continue in this terrible condition. So Maria, if you were in this situation, it sounds like you would not want to continue medical treatment to keep you alive unless you were given at least a 50% chance of recovering your mental abilities. Is this what I'm hearing from you? Yes, that's right. Sophia, do you have any questions for your mother? Can you honor this decision? Yes, it would be hard to let you go. But I now understand why grandma's situation bothered you so much. So uh, if this discussion would have happened, this, the first scenario would have been much easier for the daughter to decide. So, but that didn't happen. She chose an advanced care plan, I mean, agent, uh, but the discussion didn't happen by her mother or the physician. So if we get a chance you know, to ask, do you have an agent and the agent is there, then you ask that you know, very simple question. How much do you know? Uh, you know did your mother tell you that, that, uh, that simple probably? Um, so I, I'm going to skip these quickly because uh, Lizzie talked about it and I did mention several times. I want you to listen to um, understanding. Maria, tell situation. me what you now understand about advanced care planning. Well, it sounds like it is important for any adult because you never know when something sudden could happen. I'm not sure how to get started. Maria, when you described your experience during the last months of your mom's life, you talked about how you were in a tough position as the decision maker. You thought your mom was suffering. What was tough about being in that position? I never really talked with my mom, even though I saw her almost every day. I didn't want to make a decision that, that she would not have agreed with. It was very hard for me to know what to do. Tell me more about why you think your mom was suffering. She could not talk. She was in pain. And there was little hope she would ever get better. So you learn that without conversations, it's hard to make decisions for someone else. And you learn that suffering means different things to different people. It also sounds like you learned how stressful it can be to be a healthcare agent. So, um, so far, any questions? And so, uh, if, no, if, you know, when you made the, um, the basic um, introduction of the ACP and you uh, went through all that, then you can go uh, a little bit further and, and you can tell them, what do you know about uh, the different types of treatment available to you? Uh, do you have any questions about those? Do you have a question about CPR? Do you want, do you have any question about ventilation, dialysis, things like that? So 
doesn't have to happen during that time because the, the, it's going to take much time. That's why it's processed later on when it comes to the post, as Lizzie said, you know, you do the your advanced care planning and but then uh, you think of the post if you have it, especially with the very seriously ill people, anybody with life limiting illness or degenerative type of disease like Parkinson's, dementia, or they have an advanced stage CHF, COPD, we all know that they're gonna have all this uh, uh, outcomes and uh, it's, it's, it's going to be nice that they hear the trajectory of the illness from their physician. If we tell them this is your trajectory, this is how the COPD is gonna go, this is how your CHF is gonna go, this is the, these are the challenges with dementia, I would like you to be prepared. And how much do you know about these? Uh, as Lizzie's case was excellent because at that point the patient already had the capacity, and they they could um, you know uh, express their wishes and communicate that with uh, with their loved one. But if the dementia, the, the uh, Parkinson's advances, first of all, you can't hear them very well if even if they have capacity, or they get dementia, or the other, or our Alzheimer's patients. Uh, it will be a, a little bit difficult for families to decide. If they know this ahead of time, that will be uh, just much easier. Um, Mrs. Sanchez, your physical exam looks very good. You are taking great yeah, care of yourself and managing your diabetes and blood pressure well. As you are approaching your 60th birthday, I noticed that you do not have an advanced directive. Advanced care planning is an important part of how we provide good patient care. I'd like to help you get started today. I have a few questions for you. You may have received information about advanced care planning in the past. Tell me what you understand about this type of planning. Please call me Maria. I think I understand what a living will is, but you just said I was doing well. So why would I need to think about what I want if I were sick or dying? Maria, many people assume that this type of planning is only for when they are sick. However, we are trying to help all our patients see the importance of planning for an unexpected event, such as a car accident or a sudden illness, some event that might leave you unable to make your own health care decisions. Advanced care planning can be documented in many ways, including the completion of an advanced directive. What's most important is that we begin to help you understand what is involved. I have a few more questions. Are you willing to discuss this with me today? Okay, so that pretty much um, um, is about um, how to start, start the discussion about advanced care planning and, and then um, hold on and see what the patient wants to do. Um, uh, I'll just stop here because uh, I promised 15 minutes, but I think I went for 20 minutes. So, <laughs> so that's, that's perfectly fine, Dr. Sultani. So um, thank you. Um, before we get into some of the questions, I just want to say that while these conversations may not be something that many look forward to, having all of these tips and tricks makes it considerably easier. So let's put them into action. In the chat box right now, we're dropping a link. Clicking the link will take you to the Five Wishes website where you can redeem your very own Five Wishes document. Follow the instructions therein to ensure that your advanced care plan is accurate and up to date. We hope this will make life easier for you and for your loved ones. Um, so we're gonna leave Zoom open for a little bit so that you can work on your Five Wishes document and ask any questions you like. Um, so while we wait for some of those questions, I'm going to put this to both of our speakers. Yolanda is asking, do you have any recommendations on short videos that we can let patients watch while waiting for us? Uh, I think every, every one of us has their favorite ones. They're, um, if you're uh, a Southern patient, Southern health, um, has very some nice videos, uh, but if you don't have Southern Health, uh, there are other videos um, uh, was uh, has been in circulation for a long time by Stanford Palliative Care Program. I really like those. So you can um, go um, on YouTube or Google, just um, go advanced care planning um, uh, or, or palliative care 
regarding end of life care by, from Stanford uh, or any other place. I mean, um, I would ex um, encourage people to choose a, a very short video first. Listen to short short videos first before you go to a, 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 you know a more detailed discussions because there are some some uh, fifty minutes an hour more than an hour discussions on the YouTube. Um, but uh, I'll let Lizzie um, take over. <laughs> yeah, I I agree with Dr. Sultani. I the the ones Sutter has are very good, but they are proprietary, so you can't always um, get those. Um, but I would try to, yeah, Stanford's are very good. And I think shorter, the better. Um, you know, I think as physicians, one of the things we're always tasked to do is to do the right thing at the right time. We're like all challenged with this. So the more you can bring this up, I like to say when something kind of tickles in your mind, when you're like, ooh, this patient they may start having some real issues soon. Just like with my case with Mrs. Campbell, where she's had Parkinson's a while, but now she's falling and she's not processing as well. If you haven't already had advanced care directive conversations with her, that's a wonderful time because something is like picking up to you. You should start introducing it. I think what we get into trouble is we're like, the patient is crashing, so to speak, right? They're really having trouble. And then we're trying to do all of it in this big, like hour long discussion. So one of the things that those short videos can do is just kind of demystify it. And then, so you bring it up, you know, during the visit, maybe say, Hey, this is something I really want us to talk about. And they're like, what? And you say, you know, look, I want you to make sure you have the tools to do well. So I want to send you this video and we're going to talk about it at your next visit. And then you kind of set it in motion. Okay, we have a couple of other questions and some comments. So another question, do you schedule appointments for the sole purpose of these conversations instead of just tacking it on to a visit for something else? Uh, I usually don't. Um, I um, take advantage of the um, any um, situation comes around, but mostly um, um, adult well visit. That's that's where I I, I, I bring this uh, on, and I always bring it on when there's a change of condition, when there's a new diagnosis, when there's a decline. I always do that, um, no matter what if they have come for blood pressure or whatever, and and I notice that they're. Uh, not doing well, they're losing weight, I can't find anything about it, um, they're getting weaker, they're falling, they're getting, uh, you know, they've been in the ER already a couple of times, no matter for what reason, that's the time I start. Yeah, I think, okay, so I'll just come from my experience when I, you know, I've had a lot of different positions in my career thus far, and one of them was running a palliative care clinic. I will tell you that patients, it would, it would take a long time for them to agree to see me sometimes <laughs> because I represented, you know, something scary and uncomfortable and not that I'm saying you should ambush your patients because you should never do that. But what we want to encourage you guys is to make advanced care planning really normal um, and not scary and part of routine. So I think that's why when Dr. Sultani said to bring it up at the wellness visit is a great suggestion if you're dealing with um, adult patients or particularly seniors that they have that annual visit. And you just say, this is part of what we do at this age. We talk about medical emergencies. We make sure you have all your ducks in a row. And this is, very, this is what I do for all my patients. So I think someone already asked like, what happens if they're offended? I, so I think this addresses that a little bit is if you make it part of your normal practice that you're asking all your patients to consider this, you think it's important for everyone, no matter their background, their really to me, their age, at least to do an advanced care directive. Um, and so when you normalize things and you approach them in a compassionate way, and of course, you know, you guys, people are allowed to say no. <laughs> They're like, doc, thanks, but I'm not ready to do that. And you say, okay, but I want to bring it up to you again later. It's kind of like smoking cessation, right? Sometimes that's a tough topic, but we bring it up again later. Um, 
And, and I think when you approach it and really allow the, the patients to do a lot of the talking, like what scares you about this or kind of, whoa, you look like maybe that caught you off guard. When you let the patients kind of process their emotions and tell you why that's difficult, then you can kind of work through that kind of initial reluctance. Okay. Um, just somebody had a, um, a comment in here. Abdul says in the outpatient setting, time is a limiting factor. Documenting this then for another provider to find it is also another challenge. Dr. Giles or Sir Tommy, do you wanna to speak to that? I think they agree. <laughs> All right. Sorry, um, I, I, I can, yeah, I, that's why I think if you can do it over a couple of visits and give a little homework in between, that's why catching the patient before the huge crisis um, is good because you could do it over a couple of visits and you can give them homework, like fill this out. You know, we won't, we'll just go over it when you come back. Like there might be some questions that you feel really strongly about and some you want to ask me questions about and that's fine. Like we'll, we'll work through it over a couple of visits. Um, and then yes, I will just amen to the problem of finding these things. Um, I know there's some companies trying to do pulse registries. Um, I tell my patients to make what I call a go folder so I tell them to get one of those plastic folders because I, I work with a lot of patients that are still living in the community. So they're not living in a nursing home or something like that where their documents ideally go to the hospital and come back. But I tell them to get one of those plastic folders you know, with two slots. And I say, put your advanced care directive, keep your medication list, your list of your doctors, <laughs> um, your phone numbers for, for your important family members, that's your go folder. And if you are going to the hospital or you're going to a doctor's appointment, you bring that with you. So I do try to empower them to, to also, you know, do their best to keep track of it. Yeah, sorry, I got one of those urgent texts. So I got distracted a little bit. Yeah, I totally agree with Lizzie. And it actually, you know, I, I was, um, very uh, amazed and impressed one of my patients uh, uh, show me something that I was wow that's a, such a great idea he says I have all the advanced care planning on my cell phone I scan them it's all here if I travel if I go anywhere since my cell phone is the one I go I, I don't go without it <laughs> I don't go out without it like your your American Express the he, he says if because I know the doctors will not look for these when you're in an emergency room. I know they don't even bother about it, but I have it here. So when it happened, because it happened to his, his father and he didn't want this to happen to his mother. He said, I have it all downloaded on my cell phone. When I go anywhere, even if I'm abroad, I can just text it to the doctors. I say, here it is. That's what, that's what the mom's wishes are. And that's what you, I want you guys to do. I, 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 I thought that's a, that's a beautiful idea. You have a cell phone, you carry it all the time. Just just put a picture of it or, or scan it and keep it there. I thought I'll share that one. <laughs> all right, well, we only have about a minute left, um, but I did wanna point out that it is worth noting that most of the major plans, including Medicare, will reimburse for advanced care plan discussions. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, and um, so thank you again, Dr. Giles and Dr. Sultani. This was incredibly informative and we hope you all got something great out of this, these conversations. Um, just remember you will be receiving an email with a link to fill out your CME evaluation so that you can get your credits for attending this session. And we'll also send out the link once more to the five wishes documents. And if you have any questions of us at the, here at the Medical Society or um, to any of our speakers after this, um, just send us an email and we'll, we'll try to help you out. So again, thank you. And we hope you all have a wonderful evening.